I love all of the texts that have been read from the lectionary this morning. They speak of a revolutionary movement by God, that he is comfortable taking the old prescribed and comfortable ways of our being in relationship with him, and he flips them on their head so that everything and everyone belong. He makes his banquet table longer. He reconciles all things to himself. And we are brought back to God's great love for the entirety of its creation. Our hearts are stretched. It's a good analogy. Today I'd like to draw us into the Acts text for today, which is Acts 11, 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain it to them, step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and I saw a trance. In a trance, I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. As I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. I also heard a voice saying to me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. At that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The Spirit told me to go with them and not to make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he, had been see how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had on us in the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord and how he had said, John baptized with water but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? When they heard this, they were silenced. And they praised God, saying, Then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. So this text isn't just about what we're allowed to eat now. The apostles and believers have been noticing God's movement among the Gentiles. And this is one of the very first stories that acts as a catalyst for their participation in God's work. In studying this passage, my studious husband reminded me that the people on the margins whom Jesus ate with and spent time with they were marginalized Jews. For the most part, Jesus doesn't have very many encounters with Gentiles. This was a mind-blowing reminder for me. I often read scripture with the intent of figuring out who the outsider is. Jesus was always a friend to the outsider, and I personally love to root for the underdog. In this story of Cornelius' conversion, and I would also argue the conversion of Peter, Cornelius and his household are just on a whole other level of outsider than we see in the Gospels. It's hard to imagine that one could get any more unclean than a leper or a demon-possessed man, 
But right here in the middle of Acts, this is, this is exactly who we are talking about. The Gentiles were the epitome of uncleanliness and other. It also helps me understand a story more deeply when I can find myself within it. Who do I naturally feel kindred with in this Acts story? For the better or even to my shame, these two conversion stories are ultimately the beginning of our conversion story. Maybe the group we should feel more connected to is the Gentiles. I have to remind myself that technically I'm categorized as a Gentile because honestly, I often relate with the pious Jewish church leaders of that time more often than not. Maybe that says more about me than I care to admit today. But when I'm telling myself the truth, I like to follow the rules. I have liked black and white answers for most of my life. I ache to be right. And God knows I need to be on the inside of the correct side. Even if the aisle I'm on might be deemed wrong by somebody else. Sure, I can be open to hearing all sides of an issue, but once I've made up my mind that something is true, you'll have to work pretty hard to convince me otherwise. I assume that a great deal of humans are like this. They see the world in black and white, right and wrong, us and them, inside and outside, clean and unclean. These definite lines seem so much easier to understand and live in than the gray areas of life. But my somewhat short life experience has already shown me that the gray areas of life, they can actually be really beautiful spaces to dwell in. The Bible basically tells the same story in chapters 10 and 11. To give you a little more information from the story told in chapter 10, Cornelius is not just an ordinary Gentile. He's an army general who is sympathetic to the Jewish Christians' worldview and to their God. In fact, he prays to their God, and he gives generously to those in need. As the story goes, Cornelius sees an angel who tells him to send for a man named Peter, who will tell him everything else he needs to know. Meanwhile, Peter is having a little vision over in Joppa, and then he immediately receives word that a Gentile needs him. Peter goes with six friends to Cornelius' house. They enter inside, and Peter starts telling the household about the life he has lived at Jesus' side, about the ways Jesus brought life to that which is dead or dying. And as Peter tells them these things, the Holy Spirit falls down on them. Peter and his buddies are amazed that the Holy Spirit comes to the Gentiles the very same way it had fallen on them in Acts 2. Even to the Gentiles, the them of the us and them, the wrong of the right and wrong, the lost of the lost and found, the outsiders of the out and in. This was no small thing. There is a reason we have to hear these events again and again. A pretty massive undertaking takes shape within this story, and it would have been pretty heavy stuff for Peter and company to work through. They have been given this great promise by Jesus, and they've learned it, and they practiced it, adopting it into the details of their everyday existence. Now suddenly, the thems, the wrongs, the losts, and the outsiders become the us the right, the found, and the insiders. Everyone now has equal parts of the promised kingdom. But in chapter 11, our text, we aren't just hearing the story again. We find Peter having to defend his actions. He's on trial before his good, circumcised Jewish Christians, you know, the ones who believe in Jesus, but who are convinced there's a prescribed way to go about practicing this promise Jesus had left with them. To them, Peter had broken the rules. He stepped into the gray areas. 
They believed that all new believers had to be circumcised in order to fully receive the promise. And they're referred in our story as circumcised believers. They wonder why he, Peter, has the authority to change the rules in the system just because he wants to. They don't understand or get it at all. Maybe we can't really blame them. They weren't in the room seeing it all go down. For them, they were rightly defending their faith and calling out a heretic, justly preserving the right and prescribed state of things. Peter's defense states the facts of the story, making sure he highlights exactly how his own conversion took place in synchronicity with the Gentiles. He starts with his vision where he sees the sheep being lowered from heaven and all of the animals on it and the instruction from God that he can kill and eat any of it. By the way, this would not have been in line with the kosher laws that he had been abiding by on God's authority up until this point. Peter wants to make sure that his skeptical prosecutors know that he did, in fact, protest this kosher-breaking nonsense. I assured God, no, Lord, I have never once put unclean food on my lips. Peter's reminding them he's a good boy who follows the rules. He knows the answers. He practices God's word in the right ways. But in this vision, God says, do not call anything impure that I have made clean. God not only gives Peter permission to transcend kosher laws and go beyond the preconceived boundaries of their practices, but he establishes God's authority in the matter of who gets to name things clean and unclean. Peter is still worried that God doesn't understand that he is good and right and in and clean, and God reminds him again, I decide who is good and right and in and clean. Peter doesn't back down a third time. He tries to convince God that what he is suggesting to Peter is insane. And I believe this is where we see the Holy Spirit hard at work. The Spirit began in Peter's head, in his vision, because Peter needed his thoughts hassled out of their complacency. Peter can't experience a second conversion with a dramatic flair like Paul did just two chapters ago. Peter has been practicing his faith too long. He has ideas that have been formed over years of practice and repetition. If Peter is ever going to get to the place that God needs him in, the Spirit is going to have to do a lot of undoing first. It's going to have to stretch Peter's heart. Through his trance, Peter considers what had been exposed his own prejudices, his doubt, and his fresh vulnerability. He can now open himself up to the possibility that God is able to bring about his reconciling work in the world in brand new and even mind-blowing ways. Peter has some freedom to think differently about his faith and his knowledge of God up until that point. He is now primed and ready to live out his coming experiences with an openness and a unique tenderness toward God's kingdom, expanding in ways that seemed unmanageable and impossible until now. He is now inclined to actually believe these guidelines of inclusivity. What he had previously believed to be unclean and kosher, God authorized them all as clean. Immediately, there is a knock at the door, and it's an unkosher outsider, read Gentile, wanting Peter to come to his master's house. I love this. As Luke tells the story, he doesn't just let this new, expanding kingdom sit in Peter's head. Peter doesn't have time to let it marinate slowly or ruminate endlessly. Nope. Immediately, he is, has to put it into practice. He has to physically put his body in a place that just moments ago he believed to be dirty and unclean and somewhere that, no, Lord, I have never once put my physical person. 
in the house of a Gentile. Not only did he believe that the, that the Gentile's house would have been unclean, he would have believed that it would have made him, Peter, unclean by being inside of it. Still, the Spirit is having to undo a lot of deeply rooted beliefs and practices. So Peter's mind and heart have been opened, and the Bible says he has no hesitation. Uh, it says, make no distinction between them and us. He is authorized by God to consort with all people, as different and other as they can get. And he bravely walks along the road with them and enters the very spaces they call home. I really like this part. Peter brings some people with him. He doesn't let himself be the only one who gets to practice. The people he brings with him are not like-minded in that they too have received a convincing vision. They're like-minded that they followed the strict codes, the same codes that Peter had. In doing this, Peter's actions to me say, you know, the Lord has done something really amazing in me. He has set a vision within me, but it feels really heavy. It may be a lot to work through on my own. It's important to me that you understand my story and this new and unforeseen path, and would you mind walking with me? Maybe even helping me to discern the Spirit's work so that I know I'm not misinterpreting things. And because Peter takes these men to Cornelius' house with him, they get to become eyewitnesses to the Holy Spirit falling on a house full of Gentiles. He invites his friends into the reconciliation of Christ. He showed them that it is our experiences that make Christ's reconciliation real. We can decide in our head and in our heart what we believe about the Word of God, but our experiences flesh out that belief. Father Richard Rohr says, we don't think ourselves into new ways of living. We live ourselves into new ways of thinking. What if Peter had his vision and then spent the next few years replaying it in his head, trying to extract every last ounce of meaning from it? What makes this story so important? Peter took his newly granted permission out for a stroll. He gave it legs and arms. He was able to take all Peter had learned up to that point and push him 20 steps further. He gave Peter and his friends unshakable proof about how serious he really was about this new proclamation of inclusivity that brought reconciliation even to the Gentiles. They are able to reinterpret and make better sense of scripture because, because of their experiences. Peter remembered that the Lord had said, John baptized you with water, but you will be baptized with Holy Spirit. The obsolete, obstinate, and age-old practices that, were used to follow, that they were used to following were given fresh eyes and new heart. Our experiences through the Holy Spirit can take what we love, hold dear, and believe to be true and right, and flip it on its head. Now, the things that remain are substantive and life-giving for every person around us, not just ourselves, and not just those who are like-minded as us. It is the interactions with real human people and the Spirit's movement among each of them that gave Peter not just a story to tell, but a revelation to reveal. By the end of Peter's defense in verse 18, he makes certain that his prosecutors understand there is a new reality in play. The Gentiles now have everything the prosecutors have, minus a not so slight medical procedure and that it all happens by the, by the authority of God and not by Peter's. I'm a sucker for good storytelling. 
a well-crafted story. Stories change us. Just as it did for Peter, our experiences can reinterpret scripture for us as we see it lived out in real people's stories. Isn't that why the gospel message has lasted 2,000 years? We are drawn to the ways God actually moves and acts in real life, both in history and present day. The people around you have stories to tell about the movement of God in their lives. Some of these people, let's be honest, really hard to talk to. They feel unclean and just plain wrong. They approach their life and even the gospel in ways that feel completely foreign to us. We can have zero understanding of entire groups of people. And we will never hear their unique stories of reconciliation if we are too afraid or too uninterested or simply too annoyed to ask them questions about it. When we don't ask the questions, we miss the nuanced ways the Holy Spirit moves within our neighbors. And when we don't listen to the story of the other, we risk missing the inbreaking of the gospel to a people we deem unworthy and undeserving. It's too bad. These circumcised, rule-keeping, etiquette-following believers were able to hear Peter's defense and be convinced about the breaking in of God's kingdom and disruption of old systems because they dared to ask Peter his story. But here's the important part. Real conviction came to them not just because they asked the question, why are you eating with uncircumcised men? But because they actually listened to Peter's answer. They allowed the Spirit to do its work of undoing. They allowed the Spirit some room and some space to move and expand what they knew to be true up to that point. They allowed the Spirit to guide them further along the road into an understanding of the gray hues represented in their fellow humans. They didn't, miss, they didn't dismiss answers they didn't like for the simple fact that they didn't like them. We need all kinds of representatives for the kingdom of God. We need groundbreakers, the Peters who can see and believe a bigger vision for the whole of humanity, ones who are willing to trailblaze unwalked and scary paths, taking black on all sides because of the uncharted territory and unseen goodness with unclean people groups. We need rule followers who are in the room. They're in the room with the Peters on these journeys of blind faith. And because it can be so easy to get caught up in the excitement and romantic notions of the trailblazers, we need rule followers in the room bringing checks and balances and a realistic witness to the prosecutors that be. These grounded individuals bear witness to the wonders they have experienced and seen with their own eyes in uncharted territories. What signs and evidence do we miss about God's authority, glory, and reconciliation when we aren't even in the room? Finally, we need movable skeptics. And I say movable on purpose. What good is done for anyone when criticism and judgment and skepticism come from those who are unable to receive, consider, and perhaps be moved by something outside of themselves. The circumcised believers were skeptical as they questioned Peter's behavior, but then they were brave enough to hear something that they were really uncomfortable with. Then they allowed the Holy Spirit to do its work in them just as it had done its work in Peter and in the six men who were in the room and in the Gentiles. Maybe they recognize that discomfort is often the Holy Spirit's favorite mode of work. 
And in the same way, when we recognize the discomforting, undoing, or stretching of the Holy Spirit, we are able to face our prejudices, step into the room, and earnestly practice the peace of Christ with our physical presence alongside the other. Peace be with you.